Coming up, setting the table for the final jewel in the Triple Tiara for three-year-old fillies. They were sprinting on the turf in the Royal North, the second semi-final in our media trivia matchup, and... I'm Maddie Jo Tilly. There's a whole lot of gizmos, gadgets, and thingamabobs used on a racehorse. Stick around. Yes, we're talking horses. We're at the HPI Bet Center here in Woodbine where they really make betting easy. Joe, there are so many ways to get your wagers and you know, when you think about it, the possibilities are actually endless. All right, let's go find out. So I've got my HPI Bet card yes. and this works where? This works here on the Woodbine Racing floors at any of our wagering machines as well as our Champions locations. And how else can I bet? You can also bet online at www.hpibet.com. So I can actually use my phone? Yeah, you can bet on your phone, tablet, and your computer. Wow, did you hear that, Jason? 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 Did you hear that? You can make it with your phone. Jason? 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 Did you hear that, Jason? Jason? Are you listening to me, Jason? 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 Yeah. Welcome to the program. Joe Tully oh. alongside oh. Jason Porter. trying to make a bet. <laughs> Jeez, all right. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> well, you wonder where Canada's top three-year-old fillies will be this weekend. Well, Woodbine is the place, of course, for the third jewel in the Triple Tierra. Love the fact that we have a brand new element for the final leg as we surf onto the turf. Ten furlongs chasing that purse of $250,000. And as we all know by now, Joe, once again, no Triple Tierra champion. Right. We have two winners, Nishama and Karen but not the only horses in the race. Yeah, you know what? It's intriguing because it's the unknown for a lot of these horses. Yeah, they love to eat it. They love, you know, perhaps walking across it, but what about actually racing on it? All right, let's hear from Nick Gonzalez, trainer of Meadow Rose. Well, she's a pretty bay beauty. Her name is Meadow Rose. Uh, we were fortunate to get her this winter when we were stabled at Gulfstream. Came to us in great shape from Adina South. She's owned by Dina and Stronix, Frank and Frida, and uh, just so pleased to have her. Came to us as a unraced three-year-old filly. Got her ready to run down there. Brought her up here. Ran her in one sprint, which was just basically a tune-up. And then we got to getting her around two turns, and she won her second start. And we uh, opted to run in the Bison City. And even though we were a little light on experience, and there were like some good seasoned horses in there. She still gave an A-plus effort. It was, uh, you know, not making any excuses for anybody in there. It was a paceless race, and uh, she was lying a lot closer than she's used to lying. And, uh, you know, to her credit, you know, she finished strong, galloped out well, and came out of the race even better. She's a very versatile filly, and she's got, uh, obviously, grass, grass breeding on both sides of her pedigree. Did quite well after that uh, Bison City race. We don't think that a uh, mile and a quarter is gonna be any problem for her. Uh, we've been fortunate in the past and we won the race before with a uh, female rider too. Uh, Chantel won for us some years ago and we got our favorite girlfriend, Emma, riding her this time. So got all that going on and we're, we're, we're happy the way we're going into the race. Racing analyst Jen Morrison joins us on this Saturday morning. So Nick, uh, having good luck with the Lady Riders, we'll see if that continues as he looks for a second Wonder Wear Stakes. Yeah, and I find it interesting that, you know, these trainers that run their horses on the grass for the first time, and we're going to see it coming up in the Breeder Stakes as well, how do they know that the horses are going to like the turf if they don't actually <laughs> work them on the grass? And I was delving into the pedigree of Meadow Rose mm -hmm. a little bit. I mean, her pedigree is just so strong for European long grass races. Her mother was an Irish bred, and the father won a stakes race, a group event overseas. So it's a very strong turf pedigree. It doesn't seem to matter to Nick. He just says that she can run on anything, and I guess he knows that. He's the trainer. I'm a huge proponent of that. I always say great athletes can compete over anything. So, you know, that's what just makes... One of the reasons why I love this event, because it's all about a new venture. 
That's right. It uh, mm -hmm. evens out the, uh, you know, it makes it harder for these horses to win the Triple Tiara or the Triple Crown. You know, the races are on different surfaces. Nishama as well. Now, she had a workout on the grass and to see if she liked it. And I gather that she's liked it. Mm -hmm. But her pedigree is also very strong, top and bottom. Her sire loved the grass. The mother is from a strong family that include uh, turf stakes winners like Sweetest Thing. Definitely uh, no lack of storylines. It's the rubber match, but wouldn't be surprised to see a fresh face in the crowd perhaps upset both uh, the headliners, Karen and Nishama. Well, Jen, coming up later on today, we have another race for the three-year-old fillies. This one, though, on the tapita, seven furlongs, the Duchess Stakes. This has always been one of my favorite races because there's a real mix in here because the race is open, which right. means it's eligible horses are American breads, horses by American stallions. So the locals have it a little bit tougher, but we have one good local filly who's really rising now, and that's calling Rye Rye for owner Bob Harvey and trainer Roger Atfield. I'm a big fan of uh, this filly. She's coming off that win on the grass, now going back to that synthetic surface. Coming up tomorrow, more stakes action at Woodbine. It's the Shepperton for the boys, a sprint for three and up. Yep, and this race is for Ontario sired, so it's a restricted race, which means that all the sires of these horses stand in Ontario. And I'm looking at a horse in there if he runs Sweet Grass Creek for owner Gus Shigadance. This horse has been racing against so much tougher horses this year, and I think uh, he's ready to win a stakes event. And I'll tell you this much, uh, trainer Mike Keogh has done a wonderful job with that horse. Yeah, he sure has. Now it's time for Jen's Gems, our talking horses picks of the week. When we return on Talking Horses, we'll take a look back at Lexi Lou loving life in the Victoriana. We'll find out what your horse may want to wear, and we're not talking fashion. And we're going to joust once again with the media. We'll be back after this quick timeout. Horse people have a habit of taking care of their own. It's always been that way. The Horsemen's Benevolent and Protective Association of Ontario was formed to represent horse people's interests on a myriad of issues pertaining to the business of horse racing and the many tens of thousands of people whose livelihoods depend upon the sport. The betterment of racing at all levels is their goal. This is the HBPA's mission statement. We are committed to the future of horse racing we are horse people who have one horse and a dream. We are horse people who spend millions of dollars. We are horse people who race throughout the country. We are owners, breeders, and trainers, big and small, young and old, from one end of the province to the other. We horse people are the HBPA. We are horsemen helping horsemen. Talking Horses on CTV. Welcome back to the program. Phillies and mares went to the post last week in the Victoriana Stakes, and this was a return of Lexi Lou, former Horse of the Year. Headliner by far in this field. You know, since returning home, Joe, she's looked right at home. A couple of grade two scores in the Nassau and then the Dance Martley. Just simply too good for this field. That was a really gritty win mm -hmm. in the Dance Martley and another good win in the Victoriana. Let's get the call now from Robert Geller. Lexi Lou down the lane by one. Internal Bourbon on the outside and down the center of the track, Super Sarah. Internal Bourbon ranging up. Lexi Lou tapped up. Internal Bourbon right alongside. And the race is a match one between the two. Lexi Lou on the rail, not giving an inch. Internal Bourbon trying her heart out. Lexi Lou is unflinching and she's just dominant all the way. Lexi Lou with something in hand wins the Victoriana. Racing analyst Jen Morrison rejoins us. Uh, she loves that green out there. That's now four of five lifetime over the E.P. Taylor. You know, it's great to have her back, Jason. Like you said, she loves it here at home. And as we had previewed her last weekend, you know, let's enjoy her because, you know, she might not be racing much longer. She's probably going to go off and be a mama at the end of this year, perhaps. So um, let's enjoy her. Hopefully she'll keep <laughs> racing here and uh, we'll cheer her on some more. $75,000 payday for Lexi Lou. Uh, great effort in second by internal bourbon, just simply 
couldn't knock that big one off. Yeah, no, she really, uh, really got close there. I mean, to her, she was thinking she was really making a race out of it. Now, Lexi Lou was a bit toying with her, <laughs> but uh, good for internal bourbon, you know. She's uh, she's really rising. And she's a natural blonde, would round out the top three. More stakes action from Woodbine on the grass. Last Sunday, it was a grade three running of the Royal North. Lady Shipman, uh, back once again, trying to make amends for that uh, Highlander debacle. Yeah, now this is the queen of turf sprinting in North America, mm. and it was exciting to see her come in for the Highlander Stakes, but ugh, that was not a very good uh, performance that day, so we were hoping that she would rebound. Yeah, 180 was exactly what she did. Uh, with the call, once again, here's Robert. Getting busy is starting to get worried down the outside because Lady Shipman, is she gone here? She's a length and a half in front, holding them, trying to go further ahead. In second placing, she's explosive, and Lady Shipman is responding beautifully. She's explosive, making a great race of it, but Lady Shipman, just never in doubt. Lady Shipman completely back to her true and utter best, and Lady Shipman dominant in the Royal North. She's explosive second. Jesse, safe to say that was uh, quite the first impression. Yeah, it was fun. She, uh, she, you know, we knew going in she's a quality filly, and uh, we just wanted a clean break and, and kind of thought she'd do the rest, and she sure just did not disappoint. And it couldn't have went better from gate to wire. Uh, she popped out of the run. I made a, the lead a little easier than I thought I might, and uh, I was able to start saving some horse early on in the race, and, and, I, and I thought it would do its dividends in the end. It sure did. Randall, congratulations. How good does it feel to get that first graded stakes win? Unbelievable. We've been close. Uh, well, one time we just got beat that much in the Reader's Cup. And uh, we thought, you know, we can keep trying and trying. It's just a shame that they don't have the graded races for the female sprinters in the country. And uh, my uh, racing manager, uh, Ryan Barberson, said, why don't you look at Canada? So that's where we are. We're in Canada. And Jen, I mean, hey, we're happy to have a big name horse like that uh, racing at Woodbine. Yeah, I know, it was really cool. Um, I got a chance to uh, meet him up in the turf club uh, at the buffet, so it was neat to have him. And it's amazing, though, that Lady Shipman, who lost the Breeders' Cup turf sprint grade one yeah. last year by a head, had never won a graded stakes race. So that's really cool. Bring her up to Canada and win it, and that was really fun. Maybe we can make this Randall's home away from home with yeah, Lady exactly. Shipman. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one more to talk about uh, also for the ladies, and this one, though, taking place on the other side of the 49th. Del Mar back, as uh, most of us know by yes. now. A big looking event called the Clement Hirsch and a lot of people said it's going to be a two-horse race and it was. Yes it was. Uh, we had uh, the champion three-year-old filly of last year, Stellar Wind, taking on the multiple champion Beholder who was winning nine straight races going into this event. Yeah, it uh, was uh, quite the stretch battle between those two if you missed it. Here it is once again, track announcer Trevor Denman on the mic. Stella Wind on the outside has taken a little advantage, but Beholder's far from done. Here she comes back again. Beholder and Stella Wind, what a horse race. These two nose and nose to the wire. Beholder on the inside, Stella Wind on the outer. Stella Wind's going to beat her. Stella Wind has won the Clementelle Hirsch. What a battle. I mean, Stellar Jeez. win, I think, just wanted it more. And uh, there goes that eight-race win streak. Yeah, you know what? Um, that is what horse races are about, Jason, mm. is the battle of two horses coming down the stretch. I mean, that's one of the races that everybody was talking about on the weekend, last weekend. It was just so fantastic to watch them come to the finish. And somebody had to win, somebody had to lose. What a stretch run between those uh, two ladies. And yeah, you know what? She's a 10-time grade one winner. Beholder, yeah. I'm sure she'll be back to battle another day. Who knows? Maybe we get the rematch. Oh, well, we'll see. I mean, that's a long time coming to Breeders' Cup. Oh, sounds good. Uh, Joe Tilly will be back in a matter of moments with a look at this week's uh, news of the week. Before we get to that, uh, let's look back to Holiday Monday's running of the Seagram Cup. They are descending on Royal Sun. Mel Mitch is gathering pace, three of them. They wheel for the judge in the Seagram Cup. Are you kidding me? The center on the inside, Royal Sun, and down the outside, Breaking Lucky. And Breaking Lucky's hit the front. Mel Mitch out wide, Breaking Lucky in front. Mel Mitch flying home on the outside, Breaking Lucky. Are you kidding me? And Mel Mitch, Breaking Lucky hanging on. Breaking Lucky in the Seagram Cup. And Breaking Lucky's done it. Are you kidding me? Second, Mel Mitch third and then Royal Sun. Now it's time for our News of the Week, brought to you by Woodbine's HPI Bet.
The 40th edition of the Canadian Horse Racing Hall of Fame Gala was held last week, honoring some of the all-time greats. Mark Cassie, one of the winningest trainers in Canadian history. Daryl Wells, a longtime voice of thoroughbred racing at Woodbine and Greenwood. The late Dr. Michael Coulter John of Gardner Farms. Dahlia Wise Dan. On the harness racing side, it was the late John Ferguson, E. Filion, Bruce Johnson, Sam Pale, and Otis Fame. The Hall Gala also had a tribute for quarter horse racing legend Norm Peacock, who built Ajax Downs. Canada's Emma Jane Wilson rides in England today. She is captain of the girls team in the Shergar Cup at Ascot. Emma is a former winner of this event. A Belmont Stakes rematch last week in the $600,000 Jim Dandy Stakes at Saratoga. Creator who beat Destin by a nose into Belmont looking to do it again, but it was a maiden getting the job done. Lael Ban, a 27 to 1 shot, went wire to wire, shocking the field. Here's Larry Colmus with the call. Still there on the outside, Destin. Governor Malibu comes off the rail with a late bid, but it is a shocker. A maiden has won the Jim Dandy. Kentucky Derby champ Nyquist was back on track in the $1 million Haskell Invitational. Nyquist, owned by Canada's Paul Redham and trained by Doug O'Neill, facing his rival Exaggerator, runner-up in the Derby. Exaggerator turned the tables into Preakness. Also in the field, gun runner, third in the Derby. Let's get the call to the finish. And Exaggerator has gone right on by. A tremendous performance from Exaggerator under Kent DeSormo to win it by two. Coming up, we're going to check out the racing equipment story, our weekly handicapping segment, and some media adjusting. But first, a look at the trainer standings. A reminder, you can also join us for the radio version of Talking Horses each and every Saturday morning, 10 o'clock on G98.7. They're off. Catch the thrill and bet anywhere, anytime with HPI Bet. Use HPIBet.com on your phone, tablet, or PC to bet when you just can't be there. Join HPI Bet for free today. Stream live racing from over 150 tracks around the world. Bet with ease anywhere, anytime. It's safe and secure. Plus, receive personalized alerts, rewards, and more. Become a member, join for free today, and get up to $250. Plus, your first bet is on us. Simply go to HPIBet.com and sign up now. Welcome back to Talking Horses. You know, the choice of equipment can be a significant factor when it comes to racing horses. 100%. Uh, the smallest change can turn out to be the biggest deal. And for these trainers, you know, it's actually a lot to think about as these respective equine athletes are pretty much a work in progress. Time now to check in for this week's feature with Matty Joe Tilly. When it comes to horse racing equipment, there's a lot of different pieces to the puzzle. So let's go meet a horse racing expert who can explain all of this to us. So when the horses are in the paddock and they're getting ready to saddle, this is the first thing that goes on the chamois. And after the chamois, then they put on the pommel pad. Some horses, they go lighter, they get a, a piece of sponge that's really light. And then the saddle cloth goes on. What's the point of a saddle cloth? Well, the saddle cloth has the number of the horse in that race. So it usually has one, two, three, four, five. How many horses in that race? It's the number cloth, really. That's why they call it the saddle cloth. But back in the room is a number cloth. Now, these are all number cloth. Uh, we took the numbers out. So there's the no numbers. numbers. Are gone. Got it. Right, but it's basically the same cloth, really. And then the saddle goes on top of that. In the girth, goes underneath, and it's buckled snugly. And then the overgirth goes over the saddle, 
and that is buckle on the snug snugly underneath there like that so this is pretty much a basic setup for what's happening on a horse and race day i've noticed in the paddock you'll see beautiful designs on the horse's rear end mm -hmm. how are those made it's a template that they get from the tack shop and what they do they just put it on the back end of the horse quarters and they take the brush and go in a different direction like the coat will come in this direction and it might go another direction and create that sort of lovely design on horses. These are the jockey saddle. These are custom made for the riders, the jockey themselves. As you can see, there's no pockets on these saddles, so there's no weight to be added on, on these. These are already light as they are, right? Uh, fully rigged will be like uh, three to four pounds fully rigged with the rider. Now, we have this side, which is a lot heavier. This could be anywhere between four pounds, five, six pounds, some of them. And if, uh, if you look here, there's a flap where you can, uh, what do you call uh, the pockets, where you can put the lead in there to build up weight according to what the horses can on that race day, right? So. This can go anywhere between three to five to six, sometimes seven pounds, depends on how light the rider is or how heavy they are, you know? So, two different saddles. Why do you think saddles are an important piece of equipment? Well, it's more, more comfortable to ride horses that way, you know, with these saddles. I mean, pit your ride in bareback, you can't really get done and ride like a race day, right? But with these saddles, um, you can ride ultra short and gives you enough uh, driving strength to, to push your horse to actually go faster. What different types of blinkers are there and what are blinkers? Blinkers, uh, they put on blinkers on horses um, in order for them to focus a little bit. You know, sometimes you go on horses and they tend to look around left or right, you know, and something might call their attention. So with the blinkers, it keeps them focused, you know, pretty much look forward and especially when running, you don't want to be looking back, you want to be looking forward. These are uh, the racing bridles. Uh, we also use them in the morning time and uh, use the same bridles in the afternoon for the horses. And uh, what we do here, we put on the nose band and um, we put on the, throw over the, the lines that the jockey holds. And this is the headpiece that goes on this part goes into the horse's mouth. This is the chin strap that goes under the chin. And this goes over the, on the head, just um, behind the air part, on the head. Some you have to use the nose band, some, some of them you have to use the cage bit. So it's all, it all depends on the horse. But um, as a rider, as an exercise rider or a jockey, you have to have that experience to know what they uh, prefer, what they will travel better in. So there's a lot of different custom add-ons you can use for each racehorse. There is every, a lot. <laughs> every racehorse is different. Every, they're like humans. We're all different. All racehorses are different. Well, as you can see, just like human athletes, what you wear could help with your performance. For Talking Horses, I'm Maddie Jo Tilly. When we come back, picking a winner, maybe. Our Groom of the Week, and who's this week's media whiz? But first, a look at the owner's standings. CTHS Ontario, the voice of thoroughbred readers, supporting the well-being of the thoroughbred industry, advocating, building for the future, with awards, recognition, incentives, supporting the dream from the start to the finish, ensuring it pays to buy, breed, and race in Ontario. Don't miss your opportunity to live the dream. Join us at the Canadian Premier Yearling Sale September the 1st, the Canadian Thoroughbred Horse Society Ontario, CTHSONT.com. This is Ontario Racing. 
You're watching Talking Horses on CTV. Welcome back to the program. Now it's time for our handicapping segment brought to you by 2001 Audio Video. Jason, we both had a little bit of a rough week last week. It happens, but I'm feeling really good about yeah, this time around. I'm sensing a comeback. I oh, really yeah. am. Okay. I'm going to get you this time. <laughs> All right. Today we're looking at the 10th race. This is for Maiden Philly, so they've never won before. And I'm going to take the one horse, Prize Bourbon. And the reason I'm taking this horse is because this horse has finished second five times, second five times. Never won before, but finished second five times, including the last three races. So, prize bourbon is definitely due. Joe, uh, you know, always a bridesmaid, never a bride. So for me, you can go with that selection, although the blinkers off could make a big difference. I'm gonna take a shot with a first time starter, Koji Kondo, I mean, heck, she's undefeated. I'm already ahead of the game. And when you look at the numbers here for trainer Catherine Dave Phillips, I mean, she's batting 31% from those 29 starts. Uh, nine wins, that's also very, very impressive. I like the fact that she's strong with her first-time starters, winning 20% of the time, and ROI, return on investment of $1.55. The works are definitely good enough. So for me, Koji Kondo, just maybe she can make that first lifetime start a winning one. And hey, I got the silver in the irons. I like her second prize of Now it's time for our Groom of the Week, Jason. Who are you looking at? Joe, this week's check mark goes to groom Alafia Campbell and Starless Knight. Uh, here's a daughter of Grand Slam that really, really, really looked good. I'm going to use that word three times. And, you know, when you think about this horse bred by the Donver Stable, currently trained by Danny O'Callaghan, the body language was key. I mean, these athletes obviously don't talk, but you could just tell she was brimming with confidence, really feeling good about herself. So, uh, in the end, there were some other horses that looked good competing in the Royal North Stakes, but my check mark, once again, going to Alafia Campbell and Starless Night. And all the names for our Groom of the Week winners will get thrown into a hat at the end of the season and we'll make a draw for a dinner for four at Wendell Clark's Classic Grill and Bar. And now it's time for everybody's favorite segment, uh, with a twist, the media matchup. <laughs> uh, two fresh faces fighting it out, Joe, for the right to take on Bev Smith in the final. All right, let's see what happens. Brought to you by the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation. Back atop the sixth floor here at Woodbine, semifinal number two for the media, Peter Gross of 680 News, Katie Lamb of the Toronto Star. Category is miscellaneous. All right, here we go. Question number one. Which horse is number one all time on the earnings list? A, American Pharaoh, B, California Chrome, or C, Curlin? Number one horse in terms of money all time. AP, CC, or just C? Pharaoh, Chrome, or Curlin? Answers are A, Pharaoh, wrong. A, Pharaoh, wrong. It's California <laughs> Chrome. Oh, I knew Don't that. forget, he won the big race in the Dubai, right? So there you go. All right, so nothing, nothing, no damage. Question number two. Which jockey had more mounts over his riding career? A, Lafitte Pinkai Jr., B, Pat Day, or C, Bill Shoemaker? Which rider rode more races? Say them again. Pinkai Day Shoemaker. Let's go here. We gotta do this. Uh, you wrote with A again. This time you're right. Yes, Lafitte Pinkai, you said C Bill Shoemaker. Ooh. Pinkai wrote over 48,000. Shoemaker yeah, over 40,000. Alright, so this is it. Pressure's on here, Katie. You gotta even the score. Question number three. Which one of these trainers is not part of the 2000 Win Club? Not part of the 2000 Win Club. A. Shug McGahey, B. Bob Baffert, or C. Richard Mandela? which is not part of the 2000 Win Club, McGahee, Baffert, or Mandela? Answers are C, Mandela, C, no, you're both wrong. Mandela's got over 2,000, so does Bob Baffert. It's Chuck McGahee, who's at 1,900 and counting, so by a score of one nothing, Peter Gross wins over Katie Lamb. Good stuff, guys. Oh. <laughs> so Peter will move on to take on Bev in the final. <laughs> And congratulations to Peter Gross, who told me before the competition, by the way, that he liked himself for show money in this event. <laughs> I tell you what, uh, he's been around the game so long. I think he's got somewhat of an unfair advantage. A little bit of a ringer, <laughs> I think. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Well, that does it for this week's show. For Jason and all of us here at Talking Horses, I'm Joe Tilley. We'll see you at the track.